from me, Romy Stach, and welcome back to another episode of Derech Eretz. Education teaches us how to live, how to communicate, and highlights our morals, ethics, and values. We may ask ourselves what is important about being educated. What happens if we do not study? Is there any benefit of being educated? We spoke to Rabbi Yossi Goldman to find out more. Jews have been described as the people of the book. And by the way, the book is not book club, but the book, the Bible. And it goes back all the way to the very, very beginning. Do you know that some 2,000 years ago, there was compulsory education in Jewish life back in Israel? There was a famous man, his name was Yehoshua ben Gamla, who was credited with the first organized universal education for our children. Originally, the Bible tells us that parents should teach their children, but not all parents are always necessarily capable. And it wasn't happening. And so Yehoshua ben Gamla took it upon himself, and he's credited for it in the Talmud nearly 2,000 years ago for establishing a cheder, not just one school, but a system of schools back in the Holy Land. And it is to his eternal and everlasting credit that he is still given the points today for what he did some 2,000 years ago. But it's not ancient. It's very much a modern story. I was doing some research. Compulsory education is different in every country around the world today. Some have to this age, to this stage, to this standard, to that grade. If you look on the table, you will see that Israel today has the strictest standard of compulsory education. From age three to age 18, from nursery school through high school, there's no other country that places those demands and expectations on families to educate their children. Indeed, the people of the book. And so maybe this can help us understand another great mystery. Why there's so many Nobel Prize winners who are Jewish? It's actually embarrassing the numbers, the percentages are so staggering. As of 2017, some 900 Nobel Prizes were awarded. Of those, 203 recipients were Jewish. That's 22 and a half percent of Nobel Prize winners are Jewish. What is the Jewish population of the world? We are less, much less than 1%, less than half a percent of the world's population, but we account for 22 and a half percent of the world's Nobel Prize winners, chemistry, science, medicine, economics, etc., etc. What does that tell you? That tells you that scholarship, that education, that knowledge is something ingrained in Jewish life and in Jewish tradition. And so therefore, the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of academic studies. Originally, it was biblical studies, Torah, Talmud. Today, there's plenty of that going on in the world, but there's great universal education as well. And this really attests to it. There was a time when most people were illiterate. They had to go to the men of the cloth to read them a letter. At that very same time, little children in Jewish communities were going to cheder, were going to school. It was compulsory. It was unheard of not to send your child to school. There are so many Jewish schools to choose from in every Jewish community. And finally, in the words of the Shema, arguably one of the most powerful, most important prayers and lines in the Bible that made its way into our prayer book, the Shema Yisrael. These words shall be upon your heart, the words of the Torah, our value system. But not only that, Vishinantam Libanecha, you shall teach them diligently to your children. This is an ancient 
an eternal Jewish value. And this makes us the people of the book. OTSA CAPE is a non-profit educational organization that works with teachers and pupils in disadvantaged communities in the Western Cape. Through collaboration with the LEGO Foundation, they have introduced a new educational tool called LEGO Six Bricks and Play Box, which seeks to provide numerous skills to both ECD teachers and pupils in a fun and interactive manner. The Six Bricks Lego project um, was all about encouraging learning through play and finding the one tool that could do and that could encompass all kinds of learning that are needed for future um, educational development. And so we were lucky enough to come across it and through a um, collaboration with the Lego Foundation and Care for Education, we are rolling out the LEGO Six Bricks um, play training as well as resources into classrooms. It's one of the most powerful tools, educational tools that I've ever used. It shows our teachers how to work with groups of children and teach them skills, especially 21st century skills that they need in the most exciting way without them thinking, that, hey, I'm learning. Actually, I'm having fun while I'm doing it. And so the teachers are, are seeing the skills evolve in their children, but at the same time, through the training and through the experience in the classrooms, the teachers are seeing the skills develop in themselves. And that has been magic. When we teach teachers um, in six bricks, we teach them how do children learn by perceptual skills, by using their senses, their five senses. So Six Bricks is a wonderful resource to, to use so that teachers can also understand how children learn by using their perceptual skills. They also understand perceptual skills much better and they know how to implement it in other ways by using other resources in their classroom. Some of the most important perceptual skills that come through Six Bricks is like um, visual, where children learn by looking at things and understanding them. The others is auditory. Those two perceptual skills are very, very important for learning throughout. Um, for children to be able to hear instructions and to also listen to each other while they are playing. Other perceptual skills that we are teaching is also that children learn through tactile by touching. And with six bricks, children are touching the bricks and they are making and building things. And I think while they are building things, um, one of the other important things um, with six bricks is that they also learn to be um, working collaboratively. And this is the skill that is, not, that is needed, not only through their childhood, but it's the skill that they will be taking through to their adulthood when they go to work. It's a very useful, it's a durable project, product, a resource. It's um, relatively inexpensive, and you can do so many things. There are so many things that you can do with Six Bricks. There are so many activities that you can do um, and you are reaching the holistic development of the child. So you are reaching all the different areas of developing a child. Education evolves and it, it's fluid and Autos OK likes to move with the times and we like to make sure that we are on top of what's happening out there in the big wide world. And what was happening we were finding is that especially with the low literacy rates, a lot of our children in the ECD sector are struggling with perceptual skills, with the ability to understand how they learn, for the teachers to understand why and how these children get to learn. And so here was a tool that has been developed where 
by we can teach these skills without just talk and talk, by having teachers exposed to the understanding of why we are using these bricks and how we're using them to get that learning happening in the classroom. So when we were exposed to Six Bricks for the first time, we knew that we were playing with something that was going to change the way that we were going to look at how we trained our ECD facilitators. Ons moet vir kinders die geleentheid skep om te kan praat en om hulle woordeskat uit te brei. En dit is die ideale geleentheid. So the process behind um, the Lego Six Bricks and Playbox training is most importantly that the teachers are trained on how to use the resource effectively. So it's not just about putting the resources into the classroom um, and leaving them there for the kids to play with freely. It's about training the teachers on how to use the resource effectively to teach a whole lot of different um, educational activities that help children grow and develop, especially things like we talk about 21st century skills. So those are skills that our children will need and those are things like collaboration, those are things like expressive language, um, executive functioning skills, which are things like delayed gratification. It also teaches problem solving. Um, which is fantastic because from an early age, without realizing that the, all those um, things are being instilled in them, it's, it's a fun, interactive way of teaching those skills. The course was amazing. When I came into education, I started working without any ECD experience. But when this course was offered to us, we, I work at Phyllis Joe, so when it was offered to us, when I started sitting on the bench, learning about different theories, how children develop, it has really equipped me. Before I came to art to do the course, I didn't know that children need to think. The children need to exercise. The children need to, to speak. So all these, I found them in their developmental stages when I came here. This is what I learned. The love that I receive in this place is just amazing. And what I learned is in love we different and we got different um, vision in life, whereby um, whatever you do, you just have to consider other like care and love for other people. That's what I learned. doing six bricks training with the teachers. It's a mix of theory and practice. Um, I ensure that I don't only tell teachers what to go and do, but during uh, my training, I ensure that we do the things so that when they go back to their classrooms, they know exactly what to do because we had done it through training. And I also encourage them that these are just the activities for them to go with, but they can develop them more. One of the first things we say in our training to our teachers is this is a time where you are not allowed to say to the children, this is wrong. You are allowed to ask them how they got to their thinking. You are allowed to ask them why they thought that way. But at no point do we ever want to hear teachers say to children, no, you do it this way, do it that way. This is, this is about children, a children-centered approach to learning and through play, allowing them to engage with a resource that allows them to manifest these 21st century thinking skills into their learning and education. So the beauty of, of Six Bricks and Playbox is that in some cases in the, the schools that we work, it's often the only resource that they have. And it's amazing the, the length that this resource can go in terms of reaching children of all different ages. It's playful. It brings out skills that um, are there, but some teachers just don't know how to bring them to the fore. The beauty for me too is, is during the training how you see teachers developing and honing in on their own skills. It's playful, it's interactive, there's a lot of talking and language, so there's a lot of language development, which is really lacking in our, our society and our schools today. Um, it, it makes people feel comfortable. It's playful, which is the most important thing. I enjoy working with adults. I thoroughly enjoyed working with teachers. I think because of all the experience I have for being a teacher for so many years, 
It is now time to give back and to share your experience and your knowledge. And I think that is so wonderful and that makes it so very special. The Derek Eretz of Autis AK is giving teachers in disadvantaged areas and communities the ability to change the way that they look at their teaching, to change the way that they focus on the children in their class. And by doing that, changing the future of the children that they teach and educate. That for us is to Konolam, repairing the world. Shira Mach has received numerous awards and is highly recognized for her contribution to the development of educational practices. Passionate about teaching, her research interests center on lecturers' agency in developing teaching excellence and the influence of institutional cultures on teaching practices in higher education. The thing that's really got my attention at the moment is a discussion about education as power. You know Nelson Mandela's famous quote that education was going to be the, the solution for absolutely everybody. And in a way it can be. But if we look at education, we have to decide what exactly it is and who decides whether you can get a degree or whether you can't, or whether you can get a course or whether you can't, and what goes into that course. So I think part of understanding university education is deciding that you're going to be a, a power player in development of that knowledge. You're not going to be a victim and you're not going to be a passenger either. Because it's possible to come and just get told what to do and then you do your best and you don't understand why you're not passing or it seems too much or um, the ideas are maybe old fashioned. But you have to buy in, I think, to saying, what it is you want to know, what you want to get out of a course, and look for your own information and bring that with you to the course instead of just sitting back passively and waiting for people to give you things. Because I think that the world becomes a better place when everybody is motivated and committed and involved, and that can be at any level, whether you're in the lab looking for new knowledge or whether you're in the classroom trying to teach people to apply knowledge. So the choice of curriculum, I think, is one of the biggest power differentials. So if you're going to come into a classroom as a teacher and you got told, this is your section, go ahead and do it, and you do it year after year, and you keep the same information, then that really isn't exciting. And it's also not contributing to the concept that you are educating, you're just giving over information. And this is not the day and age where that's your role anymore. Today, anybody has access to any information. The point is, it's just information, it's not knowledge, because they can't do anything with it. If you look on Google for your symptoms in terms of healthcare, you might get the right answer, but you might not, and you won't know. So you still need to see a doctor who knows how to manage that information from their own knowledge of seeing a symptom, for example, and then they can tell you, you do have something or you don't have it. And so having just the information is not good enough. So when you a teacher in a classroom and all you're giving is information, then you're not doing your class any favours because what you really need to be doing is to help them apply that information, to make it knowledge in their own heads. Because just giving volume means that students go away and learn material off by heart um, and that's not useful knowledge because you don't retain that kind of information in your head and it's not useful when you come across a situation where you could have applied it, it's not there anymore and you don't know where to find it because you were just given it. So there are a few things that we try and help university teachers to think about in their classrooms. The first one is helping students to source their own information. So that means that they're learning the skill of discarding things that aren't credible information and they're finding information that is useful and that could be applied. The second thing you can do is to help your students apply it while you're still there to help them. So instead of using the lesson time to give information, let them have the information or find the information outside of the lesson time, then come to the lesson and help them apply. Give them case studies or give them real life situations to work with. And that's a better way 
of making sure that they're able to find the information, apply the information, and come to the kinds of conclusions that we're interested in, because people say that if you go to university, you should develop critical thinking skills. Well, what are those critical thinking skills, and how do we know that people have them unless we test for them? And how do you test for them but allowing people to practice and use information and show their creativity as well. So one of the ways of getting people to become interested in what's going on in a classroom, and one of the easiest ways that you can do that is to employ technology. Things like um, classroom interactive audience response technology, where you post questions on your PowerPoint slides and students can answer on their phones. There are much more complicated technologies that you can use in the classroom, and particularly for medical teaching, which is the field that I'm in. Um, for example, they're now looking at holographic learning, where you can build a hologram in the middle of the classroom and students can enlarge certain areas of it or go into finer detail or layer different muscles and tissues and nerves over a specific area all in 3D in front of them in the classroom. So it's actually changing the architecture of what higher education needs to be. The question of whether somebody needs a university degree in order to get a job or to make it easier for them to get a job, I think is one that needs interrogating because not everybody needs to go to university. And there are very creative people and also people who are very good with their hands, for example, who can go into trades and be very successful in that sphere. The problem with university is we're now developing a kind of generic um, brand where people come in and go out and they're not seeing that they have to upskill themselves along the way. And that is problematic with regard to what the job market is looking for. So in my context, I speak about helping lecturers to uh, develop skills and to understand that their responsibility doesn't end with the words that come out of their mouths. That it is part of the classroom responsibility to help each student understand where it is that we're coming from. And I think that that involves a basic derech eretz. It's that we have to give people the opportunity to learn from us as experts um, at whatever level they come in at. And that we have to be patient enough and persistent enough to know that education is not just the first time you say it. It's thinking of many different ways to put the same thing so that everybody can eventually see all parts of the elephant and not just the trunk or the tail. As the saying goes, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. We would love you to be part of the conversation, so share your views and stories on our Facebook page at Derek Eretz Connect. From me, Romy Stach, and the Derek Eretz team, remember, education is the movement from darkness to light. <laughs>